Tonight we have Craig Biddle with us speaking on the Trinity of Liberty, Individualism, Individual Rights, and Independent Thinking. Craig Biddle is the editor of The Objective Standard, a quarterly journal on culture and politics, and the author of Loving Life, The Morality of Self-Interest and the Facts that Support It. Mr. Biddle has lectured and taught seminars at universities across the country, including Stanford, Duke, Tufts, UCLA, and NYU. So please join me in welcoming Craig Biddle. Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you, Doug and Hannah, for uh, bringing me. I'm delighted to be here. So I'm here to talk about uh, liberty and uh, how to help uh, spread the word about how to defend liberty properly. Now, this is obviously a very sympathetic audience. There's nobody in here who's against liberty. Um, but the fact is, there aren't many people who are against liberty anywhere. If you ask them, you know, are you for or against liberty? Uh, everybody seems to want to say that that's what they're for. Uh, certainly, liberals like to say, "Oh, we're for liberty." Uh, that's you know, the, the term "liberal" has even been co-opted by the, the left uh, because they uh, they see the value of, rec of of you know being an advocate of liberty. Certainly, libertarians claim to be for liberty. Uh, conservatives claim to be for liberty. Everybody's for liberty. Yet, we have more and more laws restricting our liberty. We have more and more politicians acting against our liberty. We are losing our liberty in many respects. Now, not in all respects. Some things are getting uh, better. You know, there, there are aspects of the culture, even politically speaking, that are getting better. If you're uh, homosexual today, you're better off than you were uh, you know, many uh, uh, decades ago and so forth. So there are instances uh, where we're not losing our liberty. But certainly, economic liberties are being constricted in ways that are pretty alarming. So the question is, is every, if everybody's for liberty, yet we keep losing our liberties, or substantially losing our liberties, why is that? Shouldn't it be the case that if so many people are for liberty, if this is something that, that's good, that we would be naturally moving in that direction politically? The answer to this conundrum lies in understanding what liberty actually is, which is not too difficult, and then understanding what liberty licenses, what liberty enables people to do. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is that, what liberty licenses, what it enables people to do, and then how to defend liberty uh, uh, based on the problem that, that's going to arise from that. So what is liberty? Liberty is simply the condition under which people are free to act on their judgment free to act on their judgment and to keep and use the product of their effort. That's what it means to, to have liberty. So if you want to go dancing, you can go dancing. If you want to be a doctor, you can be a doctor. If you want to be a farmer, you can pursue farming. If you earn money, you get to keep that money and spend it on whatever you like. You can buy a yacht if you earn lots of money and the yacht's yours. If you start a business and, and you uh, employ a bunch of people, you can fire them at will if you don't want them working for you any longer. You can hire new people. You can pay people whatever you want. There's no minimum wage. There's no maximum wage. Liberty means just that. You get to act on your judgment for your own sake across the board. No one can stop you from living your life the way you want or from keeping the product of your effort. This is what liberty is. Now, how is this problematic? Well, think about what it means if you have a legal system that legalizes liberty. So that you really do get to act on your judgment and keep the product of your effort and so forth. What has been legalized in that case? What has been legalized is selfishness. That's what it means to legalize liberty. That's what it means to say that you may, as a matter of legal protection, act on your judgment for your own sake. That means you have literally legalized selfishness. 
This doesn't mean you have to be selfish. You could live under a system of liberty and act <clears throat> sacrificially. You could go feed soup to bums at soup kitchens on the weekends rather than improve your own life. You could do all sorts of sacrificial things. That would be your prerogative. But if you live under a system of genuine liberty, you live under a system in which selfishness is fully legal. You can do whatever you want as long as you don't violate the rights of others, as long as you don't interrupt their liberty, you can act fully selfishly. Now, there are many reasons that people oppose capitalism. Some have to do with uh, uh, false ideas that are taught about the history of businessmen. Some have to do with moral positions, and some have to do with uh, confusions uh, about what concepts mean. There are all sorts of confusions. But I think one of the most fundamental reasons that people oppose liberty, even when they say they're for liberty, the most fundamental reason that people oppose it when they go to the ballot box or when they're talking about what they'll genuinely support politically is that liberty, real liberty, legalizes something that most people think is immoral. Selfishness. Does it make any sense to say, well, I would like to, the, 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 the ideal social system, the most moral social system, is the one that legalizes, that specifically legalizes this one thing that we all regard as immoral. Selfish. Right. So, it, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. This, I think, is a huge part of the problem today, is that people claim to be for liberty, but because liberty legalizes selfishness, they're really not for liberty when the rubber meets the road. When it comes time to make a, a political decision or to cast a vote, or to decide whether to criticize a politician for casting a particular vote. So what's the solution to this problem? And I propose that both in our own thinking and in the way that we present ideas to other people, a good way to a, a approach this problem is to think of what I call the trinity of liberty. To think of the battle for liberty as a trinity, as three things that are simultaneously one thing. And the three things that I have in mind are individualism, individual rights, and independent thinking. And I want to talk about the relationship of these things and the goal of genuine liberty and, and how I think all of this works <coughs> together. If you're familiar with the philosophy from which I speak, which is, of course, objectivism, and I understand we have uh, a lot, if not a, a majority, of objectivists here today, um, then you can, if, if you're in agreement with those ideas, then you can take this sort of as a methodological study. If you are not an objectivist, then there will be some specific content here that will be new and, and hopefully of interest, too. But I think I'll be able to speak to both uh, elements in the audience in the way that I proceed. Now, I like to start in discussing liberty with somebody who's for it. And this is the idea, you know, you, you, you would use this kind of an approach when you're talking to people who say, yes, I'm for liberty. So, you know, Tea Party type people, um, and people who genuinely mean this to some extent. I mean, the left may claim that they're for liberty, but if you're on the left after a, a, a century of rivers of blood based on, uh, you know, the implementation of collectivism, unless you're under 18 years old, you know, you're probably not innocent in that mistake. So really, we're, we're trying to convert people who are on the right in some respect. They're, they're for freedom and liberty in some way, but they don't understand how to undergird this idea. They don't understand how to really fight for this idea in a way that works. And I like to start with a person like that by saying, look, the fundamental at the political level is what? It's, it's individualism versus collectivism. Either the individual is sovereign, politically speaking, so that he is the unit of, of legal concern, or he's not, in which case the collective is, or the state is, and the individual gets subordinated to the state. I mean, individualism is the idea that the individual has a right to act on his own judgment for his own purposes, that he's not owned by the collective, that he's not owned by the state, that his mind, his body, and his effort, and the product of his effort are his. Collectivism, of course, is the contrasting view. No, the individual is not sovereign. 
the collective, whether it's uh, the you know uh, a communist uh, you know uh, uh, system in which the community is said to be the higher authority, or whether it's a fascist system, fascism means groupism, in which case the group, or whether it's any other form of statism in which the state says, well, we represent the collective and the individual is going to do what we say and the individual is going to be taxed so that we can spend the product of his effort on the collective and so forth. That's the basic alternative at the political level. And this is not news to anyone here. But that's precisely why I like to start with this point. Because anybody who's really for liberty in some respect can see a difference here, particularly given the last century, that individualism versus collectivism is a pretty straightforward, non-controversial distinction. Uh, but what is it that makes the distinction? And this is going to drill us down another level. It gets a little more controversial. We're going to get controversial as we go, more controversial as we go. So, when you're talking about individualism, naturally, you're always using the concept of individual rights, the idea that the individual has a right to the product of his effort and to act on his judgment. That's invariably a part of the discussion of what individualism is. Individualism is a political ideology. And it incorporates and includes a moral principle, the principle of individual rights. So that's what I want to move to next. What is this thing? the principle of individual rights. What is a right? Now, there's a lot of confusion on this uh, subject among advocates of liberty. Some people think that rights come from God. Uh, some people think that rights come somehow from nature, but they can't really explain how that is, whether they're in us somehow, or we're born with them, or they're out there and they, they are sort of uh, uh, radiate into us in some way, or whether they're just uh, you know, saying they come from nature is another way of saying that they come from God. It's very easy for people to say that people have rights and to say, yes, you have a right to the product of your effort. It's another thing to say, well, where do these things come? Why do you have a right to the product of your effort? Where do rights come from? How do we know that we have them? If you say that they come from God, you've got a tall order because you can't even prove that God, or whether you believe in God or not, it's second to this question, secondary to this question. But proving that God exists is very, very difficult. I say it's impossible, but it's, it's, it, it's a tall order. So if rights come from God, you've got that tall order. Plus, even if he does exist, you've got to somehow prove that he issues rights into you somehow that can't then be violated even by him. Otherwise, they wouldn't really be rights. They would simply be permissions from God. Right? So that whole approach to what rights are is very problematic. If they come from nature and you can't explain why we have them, they just somehow come from nature. Well, yeah, they're out there or they're in here. Well, if you cut somebody open, you're not going to find rights in there. If you go out looking for them out there, you're not going to find rights out there. So what does it mean they come from nature? We don't pick them off of trees. And they don't, you know, it, and if you were born with them, if they were inherent in your being human, how could you ever punish a criminal? So he violated somebody else's rights. If rights are innate in him somehow, then he still has them. You can't put him in jail, he's got rights. So if rights are innate, then you, they, you, they can't be forfeited. You know, you always have them. But the fact is, they're not innate. Rights come from something else. Rights, in fact, as Ayn Rand has explained, are moral prerogatives based on, and in fact, themselves a part of, the requirements of human life on Earth. We have rights specifically because in order to live and prosper, we have to be free to act on our fundamental faculty that enables life and prosperity, our minds. Human beings live by looking out at reality, figuring out uh, the requirements of their lives, and figuring out how to pursue those requirements, things like, well, you know, we need food, clothing, and shelter. How do you uh, procure these things? We need uh, friendship, and we need romance, and we need recreational activities, and we need liberty so that we can actually do this stuff. We, we learn about the, the reality that we live in and the requirements of our life by using our minds, by looking out at reality and using logic and forming concepts and principles on the basis of what we see. And this is ultimately why we have a right to act on our judgment, because our life requires it. We live by acting on our judgment. 
If you take away my ability to act on my judgment, you have made me either a serf or a slave or simply dead. You tie me to a tree, I can't act on my judgment, I'll die unless you untie me. If you make me produce stuff for you and take it from me, then I'm your slave. If you do that in part but not in full, then I'm your serf. None of that is a human life. A human life is a life guided by the judgment of your own mind. That's what it means to be a human being. You think and act on your judgment, and that's how you live. So rights come from the requirements of human life. But again, we're still at this problem that, well, wait a minute. If you can act on your judgment and keep the product of your effort, and no one can force you to give it away, that doesn't mean you can act fully selfishly. Yeah, it sure does. It's exactly what rights do. Rights bridge from morality, morality proper, a proper code of morality, which is a code of values that helps you understand how to live your life and make it great. And rights say, because you need to act on your judgment, because that's the moral thing to do, now, this is very controversial, right? This, is not, this goes against 2,500 years of Christianity and Judaism and, and the whole uh, history of ethics practice. But rights come from a moral code that says you should act on your judgment and act in your self-interest and make your life great. And the reason you have rights is because since that's true, you must be left free to act on your judgment. And this ultimately is what rights are, why we have them, and where we come from. Now, this is just a really quick snapshot of the issue. But this is why we have rights. We don't have rights because a God gave them to us, and we don't have rights because the government said we do. Those would be permissions. And we don't have rights because they're innate in us. We have rights because freedom of action is a requirement of human life. And because, as Ayn Rand points out in multiple places in her work, and her whole ethics is built around this, human life is the standard of moral value. And individuals are just that, individuals with their own lives, their own lives, uh, and, and their own bodies, their own minds, their own values to pursue. And they have a moral right to live and to pursue their values and make their life great. And that right is precisely a prohibition on using force against them so that they can live. Now, if somebody wants to act sacrificially or act contrary to his life, that is his business. His life is his, it's no one else's. And this is the full meaning of individualism as against collectivism, except we're down at a lower level here, a more fundamental level, the level of individual rights. And we've even gone a little bit deeper than that, because we've said, well, why does man have rights? He has rights because he needs to act on his judgment in order to live, which is what he should do. And there's this hierarchy here, as you can see, of what goes on at the political level, what rights are, what they mean, and what they ultimately sanction. And what they sanction is selfishness. Individual rights and liberty ultimately sanction self-interested action. They, they legalize it. So the thing is, if you want to be for liberty, you have to advocate the moral code that underlies it. The moral code that liberty is supposed to protect and legalize. The moral code of self-interest. Now this is a lot to get a head around. For the first time somebody hears this kind of stuff, like, wait a minute, this is contrary to what I learned in Sunday school. This is not what my college professors taught me. What do you mean people should act on their judgment and, and keep the product of their effort. I mean, that kind of sounds good in theory, but if you put that in practice, that means people can really be selfish. And that's exactly what it means. And it's not too difficult to jump to understand that this is what it means, which is why I think we need to, as advocates of liberty, start to be very specific and very explicit about the fact that liberty or capitalism, or whatever you want to call the social legal system that says you do in fact have rights. To act on your judgment, keep the product of your effort. We need to tell people, we need to conceptualize this on our own, and we need to tell people that what this means is that selfishness, the real deal, self-interest, complete, full, unmitigated selfishness, is legalized by this process. 
Because this is where the battle lies. If we cannot defend self-interest, then we cannot defend liberty, because that's what it legalizes. So how do we defend, and how do we advocate, and how do we spread the idea that self-interest is moral? Because this is really where the battle is. As I said, there are other elements to some extent, because you know, false historical data that people have been fed through bad schooling systems and the like has something to do with people's inability to understand uh, how to defend liberty. But by and large, I think the fundamental issue is that liberty legalizes selfishness. So this brings me to the third element of the Trinity, independent thinking. I'd like to point out that no libertarians or Tea Party type people would ever say, well, if you're raised in a family that advocates capitalism, you should advocate capitalism. But if you're raised in a socialist family, you should advocate socialism. Because, you know, you should kind of just do what your family says you should do, right? I mean, nobody would say that. That's absurd, isn't it? We need to take this same standard, the standard of independent thinking, the idea that, of course, you should think about it yourself and make your own decision based on the facts, and remind people that they have an obligation, a moral obligation to themselves to make the same kind of analysis, not only on political matters, but on moral matters. People tend to accept moral ideas very uncritically, much more uncritically than they accept political ideas. And this is a problem. And it's a problem that's relatively easy to identify and point out to people. You say to them, look, you would you would never accept socialism just because your parents said you should be a socialist. So why do you accept the moral code just because your Sunday school teacher or your professors or your family told you it's right? You shouldn't. We need to start putting pressure on people, psychological pressure. Now, this is not the same thing as the argument from intimidation. I'm not saying that if you don't agree with me, you're stupid. No. But we should tell people that there is a moral obligation to know why you are advocating what you're advocating. <coughs> If you're advocating a moral code and you have no idea why it's true, you just, well, I just heard it was true, that is not a legitimate ground to advocate a moral code. Nor is it legitimate to say, well, I just have faith it's true. I'm sorry, but if your faith impinges on my life, I mean, I know we have some Christians in this audience, and I'm certain that Christians will be watching this video if it ever goes up, but let me remind you Christians that you don't like the idea that Muslims say that, well, our faith says that you guys should be beheaded. Right? Your faith should not come into, certainly should not come into the political arena, but frankly, it shouldn't even come into your decision about what's right and wrong. Just because your preacher told you something doesn't make it true. And just because you read it in the Bible doesn't make it true. The Bible's a book. I wrote a book that says the opposite of the Bible, and it's a book too. And you shouldn't take my word for it either. You should understand why the moral ideas that you accept are true. And if you don't understand why the moral ideas that you've been accepting are true, you should step back and say, well, wait a minute. I'm not going to continue to embrace these ideas until I understand that they are true. We need to start, as advocates of liberty, saying to people, look, you can't defend liberty without defending selfishness. And if you don't know why selfishness is immoral, you're just going to say that. If you don't know why self-sacrifice for others is the moral ideal, which we were all raised with, if you're just going to mouth that to other people and just continue to embrace it because, well, that's the way I was raised, that is morally irresponsible. And we need to take people to the mat on this. This is the only way that people are eventually going to come around. If people will not think for themselves, then they are never going to be able to understand what is wrong with the moral code that they have embraced that is retarding their ability to advocate liberty. And we need to tell them that just as they wouldn't advocate po a political position without understanding why it's true or why, the, why they should advocate it, they should not do so in morality. I want to say more about how to help people understand why self-interest is moral and why uh, Ayn Rand's whole uh, ethical code, rational self-interest, which she called rational self-interest, is true and what grounds it and how to deal with that. But before we turn there, I want to talk about the one thing 
that all elements of this trinity uh, are elements of or, or are uh, manifestations of. So we've got individualism, which is this political ideology. We have individual rights, which is this moral prerogative to act on your judgment for your own sake. And then we have this idea of independent thinking. What ties these together? What are they all a part of? They're all a part of a moral code indicated by the first letter in each of the three. Individualism, the I. Independent thinking, the I. Individual rights, the I. I've got those last two in reverse order there, but you get the idea. The I. The I. The moral code of the I, of the ego, of the self. Egoism. These are all elements of egoism. Egoism is the morality that says that you, the individual, should act on your own judgment for your own sake so that you can live and be happy. And it provides a whole series of principles that help you understand how to do that, why it's proper to do that, and how to make your life great in accordance with that standard. At the next level up, the principle of egoism becomes the principle of individual rights. Why do you have individual rights? To legalize what's moral. <coughs> Acting on your judgment for your sake so that you can live a wonderful life. That's what individual rights enable you to do. At the top level, up at the political area, what is individualism? It is the political ideology that codifies all of this and says that's exactly right. Since you should act on your judgment and you should be free to act on your judgment, we must therefore have a political system that recognizes that the individual is the, the, the fundamental unit of uh, legal and political concern. We need a legal system that says the individual gets to do whatever he wants with his own life and his own property as long as he doesn't violate other people's rights by using force against them, which is the only way that rights can be violated. And then the individual thinking aspect of this, what is this? That's the centerpiece of the moral code of egoism. You have a mind. Nobody else has a mind that can think for you. Only individuals have minds. There's no group mind. Only individuals have minds, and only individuals can think. If you want to know, or if somebody you're talking to wants to know what's right, morally speaking, you have to think yourself about it. You have to look at the facts and process those facts yourself. If you want to know what you should do with your life, you have to think for yourself about what you want, what's plausible, what's feasible, what. Uh, what potentials uh, exist, what skills you have, and so forth. The individual has to do his own thinking, both to make his own life great and steer his life, and to understand moral and political issues so that he can help defend his liberty and the freedom that he loves and needs in order to live. Individualism, individual rights, and independent thinking are all aspects of egoism. The individual thinking aspect is one of the central virtues in egoism. The individual rights is simply the principle of egoism risen into the political level saying since you should act selfishly, you must be free to act selfishly. And the individualism aspect is simply the political manifestation of that that codifies it all and says, yes, we need a, a legal social system that says the individual gets to do what he wants as against collectivism where the collective gets to dictate or the state. There is a trinity here. There are three things that are separate things in a certain respect, but they're all unified by being elements of one thing. Egoism. Now, there's a lot to egoism, and I'm not here to give you a whole uh, you know, uh, talk on egoism. I'm, if you haven't yet read it, and, and for those who have, one of the things we need to advocate to people if we want them to start to understand how to undergird liberty, read Ayn Rand's Virtue of Selfishness. I mean, once people start to understand that self-interest is moral and that it's really the true morality, the morality that is it's correct, that, that, that is grounded in the facts of reality, that we win. Liberty wins. Because if it's true that, that self-interest is moral, then obviously you've got a legal system that enables it. Just as you can't defend a political system 
of self-interest, like capitalism, with an ethical code of self-sacrifice, like altruism, just as you cannot do that. So, if you want to defend a political system of self-interest, you must embrace a political system or an ethical code of self-interest. And if you do that, it's a no-brainer that you should have capitalism. Of course, if people should act on their own judgment for their own sake, we've got to have a system that enables that. Precisely what, what capitalism is all about. Capitalism legalizes selfishness. And we should not run from this fact. We should boast about it. We should be loud and clear about this fact, and then we will be talking to people at the level where they need to understand and change their mind. There aren't very many people who are unclear about what capitalism is today. I mean, decades ago there were. Today, I think people understand capitalism, I'm not talking about what the left tries to pretend capitalism is in order to attack it. I'm talking about tea partiers who understand, yes, capitalism is when you get to work and keep the product of your effort, and your life is yours. A lot of people understand that on some level, but they can't defend it. But they can't defend it. They can't defend it because in order to defend it, you have to defend self-interest. And we need to tell them this, and then we need to tell them how to both understand why self-interest is moral, help them uh, learn about Ayn Rand's ideas and what rational egoism is, how it's grounded in the facts of reality, what its principles are, why, that, why it does not mean stabbing people in the back to get what you want and this, that, and the other. I'm going to talk about some things concerning that in a minute. And if we can help the culture to move in the direction of people understanding the moral propriety of self-interest, we win. Liberty wins. And it's the only way liberty can win. So how do we do that? Well, I've indicated one thing already, and that is I think we need to take people to the mat and say, if you are accepting a moral code just because you learned it in Sunday school, that is morally irresponsible on your part. You are not being an independent thinker. You are not being an independent thinker. If you want to be an independent thinker, then you should either tell me, you should, you should be able to tell me why self-sacrificially serving others is moral, because that's what altruism says you should do. Uh, you, know, you are your brother's keeper. Uh, you know, coming from the biblical end, or the, you know, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, coming from the, the secular religionist, uh, collectivist, or communists. However you want to put it, it's all, it's all the same thing. It's altruism. And there aren't any facts of reality to support it. So people who embrace the idea that being more consistent, self-sacrificially serving other people, they can't point to any facts to support it. We need to tell them that they can't demonstrate to them that they can't by asking them to do it if they, if they say, well, right, of course that's more. Okay, well, where are the facts that support it? You can't point to the Bible, that's a fallacy. You can't, tell, you can't say my professor told me, that's a fallacy. Now, appeals to authority are not arguments for anything. We need to tell people that if they're embracing this moral code, they're doing it in a second-handed fashion. This is another concept from Ayn Rand's uh, philosophy that we should start employing. Being a first-handed thinker, being an independent thinker, means knowing why the ideas that you embrace are true, or not embracing them yet. If you don't understand why a particular idea is true, then you shouldn't embrace it yet. You should say, I don't know about that one yet. If you know why it's false, then you should reject it. And if you know that it's true, if you really know that it's true, then you should embrace it. But it is wrong to accept ideas on second-handed grounds. It is wrong to accept ideas just because other people say so. So one of the things that I think we can do is make clear some of these distinctions that, and I speak to you objectivists now, too few objectivists employ elements of our philosophy that are helpful in, uh, in getting people to understand these ideas. Tell people about what the distinction between second-handedness and first-handedness is. A first-hander is a person who looks at reality for himself, makes his own judgment, decides what he thinks is right based on his own observations and logic and so on. And a second-hander is somebody who doesn't turn to reality first, but rather says, well, what do other people think? That's a really helpful distinction. Remember when you first read The Fountainhead and you were like, wow, that's really... Help people open their eyes. Once people understand that, they may say to themselves, wow, I never realized that I accepted this moral code just because I was raised that way. I think a lot of people innocently do this. But once they know that there's a distinction here, and once they know that they're doing that, they might say, whoa, that's, I, that's not right. I shouldn't do that. 
And then they're starting to think in the right direction. And maybe I need to start asking the questions about why is altruism moral? Maybe it's not moral. Maybe egoism is moral. That's a good place for them to be. This is where we need to help people go. Other elements of Rand's philosophy that we need to help pull in to the discussion, both then again in our own thinking and in the way that we deal with others, or if you're new to these ideas, look these ideas up yourself. One of the ways that people are duped into thinking that self-sacrificial service to others is the way to go, morally speaking, is through what Ayn Rand called package deals. Package deals are, a package deal is a specific kind of fallacy. It's the fallacy of treating things that are actually different that are actually fundamentally different as though they are the same, conceptually in our mind, as though they are the same on the basis of, sim of, of similarities that are superficial rather than fundamental. So I'll give you an example. Very frequently we hear when people talk about the word selfishness, they'll say, well, well s uh, selfishness isn't good. Isn't that what Bernie Madoff did? Or isn't that what John Gotti did? They aren't these guys selfish? And we need to say, well, wait a minute. If, if being selfish means doing things that are good for yourself, I mean, what else could it mean? It kind of, just kind of makes sense that that's what the word would mean, selfishness, things that are good for the self. What business do Bernie Madoff and John Gotti have in that concept when you've got people like Michael Dell and uh, you know, Michael Jordan and all sorts of people who don't you know, rape, pillage, and plunder and, and defraud people and whatever? What do these people have in common? They don't have anything in common. The only superficial thing that they have in common is that they acted on what they wanted to do, allegedly in their self-interest. Well, is Bernie Madoff the model of what is self-interested? He's sitting in a jail cell where he reports that he's happier than he was before he went there because he's not so paranoid anymore about getting caught for all the fraud that he was committing. John Gotti, other criminals and the like, are these guys happy people? Even when they're not caught for what they're doing, the, the life of a mobster is not self-interested. There's nothing glamorous or wonderful about these guys' lives. They live in paranoia. They can't trust their friends. If their friends are criminals too, oh great, all my friends are criminals. I think I'll have a party and see if my stereo equipment's there in the morning. It's ridiculous. <laughs> if your friends are criminals, then that's not self-interest. And if they're not criminals, then all of your relationships with them are based on a lie. So you're a criminal, and they're not. You've got this one. I mean, there are countless, or you could go on for hours about what is unselfish about criminal and rights-violating activities. There's nothing selfish about any of that. What's selfish is to have wonderful relationships with good people, to work hard, trade, earn a lot of money, spend it on yourself, your family, and your loved ones, and love life. None of that is criminal. So these things don't belong in the same package. This is why Rand called the fallacy package deal. It doesn't make any sense to put Michael Dell and John Gotti in the same category. One of them is acting self-interestedly, and he's living a wonderful life. The other one did not and is not, or is Gotti dead? I always forget the status. It doesn't matter, really, where he is or what. And so there's no rationale for putting these kinds of things together. Now, the package deal is committed on the other side of the equation, too. A lot of people think, well, isn't selflessness good? Isn't serving others good? All right. Well, sure, Michael Dell serves a lot of people. He served millions and millions of people. How does he serve? He employs a lot of people. He sells computers and computer-related uh, uh, gadgets and, and mechanisms to a lot of people. But, now, what is, wait a minute, is, is he being selfless? That doesn't really make any sense. What's he doing there? He's trading. He's, he's gaining while the people who he's trading with are gaining. Everybody's gaining. There's nothing selfless about any of this. Yes, he's serving people, but he's not doing it in a selfless manner. He's doing it in a selfish manner. He's gaining. They're gaining. Everybody's gaining. This is good. What business does he have in the same category with someone who throws her life away by, for instance, may moving to Calcutta and washing the feet of strangers in exchange for exactly nothing. Namely, say, Mother Teresa. These people have nothing in common. Michael Dell and Mother Teresa have nothing in common except that they are serving people in some way. 
But that is not a fundamental. That's why this is a package deal. Just because they're serving somebody doesn't say anything about the motivation behind their serving. Serving people can be done in a completely selfless way or it can be done in a completely selfish way. And these are completely different things, fundamentally speaking. We need to help people understand this. We need to point out these package deals and say it doesn't make any sense. And once you do point it out, people can see. I mean, there are people on the left who will never see this because they don't want to. But people in the Tea Party movement and, and people who are genuine advocates of liberty and are intelligent, reasonably intelligent people, this is not that hard to understand once you point out the distinctions. And this is what we need to do. We need to get people to start thinking at this level. And if we're not thinking at this level ourselves already, then we need to start thinking at this level. Because you cannot defend liberty with the morality of self-sacrifice. You just can't do it. So Ayn Rand's idea of, of a package deal, package deal packaging selfishness together when these things don't belong together. What, what's the right term for a John Gotti or a Bernie Madoff? Irrational, stupid, moronic, self-sacrificial. Bernie Madoff gave up his life. Not only give up his life, he's responsible for the suicide of his son. That's got to feel good for a father. There's nothing self-interested about what these morons do. Don't give them that term. Selfishness is clearly about doing things that are good for you. The term couldn't conceivably mean anything else. So, and then on the other side, you know, don't let people and don't in your own mind package together serving people or being nice to people as though that's the equivalent of what altruism is about. Altruism isn't about serving people. Capitalism and self-interest involve serving people in all sorts of ways. I serve my wife dinner every night and breakfast every morning. I'm the chef in the house. This does not make me an altruist. I love her. I love to do, right? So you cannot package these things together willy-nilly. And this is what we need to help people start to understand. Another element of Rand's philosophy that I want to pull in here that helps people understand what selfishness is and, and why it's proper to think of it, at least consider it as, as a possible uh, alternative to what they were taught in Sunday school by their philosophy professors. Ayn Rand identified another fallacy. It's called the fallacy of the frozen abstraction. This is another way to think about these ideas and to help other people think about them. And to you objectivists, again, I say, we do not speak about these ideas enough. It's, it's not the case that people don't understand what capitalism is, so we should be running around the country telling people what capitalism is. I mean, granted, there's something to that. And some people aren't fully clear on what capitalism is. The battle is at the moral level, and that's where we need to be doing our work. And, and we have a lot of tools here that we haven't been using. And the fallacy of the frozen abstraction is one of them. So what is this? The fallacy of the frozen abstraction is, is the fallacy of taking a, a concept, a broad concept, such as the concept of egoism, and freezing that concept at the level of one of its, one of the units that is properly subsumed under that concept. So you've got this concept of, of uh, did I say egoism? I meant to say uh, morality. I'm sorry. Back off. <clears throat> Take a concept of morality. Morality is this broad concept. And under the concept of morality, you have several possible moralities. There's altruism. There's egoism. There's hedonism. There are various things. Uh, the, uh, uh, religious morality, saying you, know, you should do whatever God says and so on. And there are other moral codes that come under the broad banner of morality. The question remains which of these possible moral codes is the true morality, which one is demonstrably true. That question remains open until you've solved it in your own mind, until you know the reasons why one of them is true, if any of them are true. But until you know why one of them is true, you should not assume that any of them are true. The fallacy of the frozen abstraction consists in taking the concept of morality and equating it, freezing it at the level of altruism or any other of the, of the moral, possible moral codes down here, freezing the overarching abstraction at the level of one of the units that's properly subsumed under that overarching concept. And most people do this with morality and altruism. To most people, the concept of morality is the equivalent of the concept of altruism. It's the same thing. When they think 
of what it means to be moral, they immediately think self-sacrificial service to others. They're the same thing. And the reason so many people think this is because we were raised this way. We were all raised to think that, that being moral consists in self-sacrifice, self-sacrificially serving others. You're taught this for, in the sandbox when you're told that you must share your toys. Why? It's my toy. No, you must share that toy with him. He wants it. But it's, it, you know, this is self-sacrifice. And you're told that it's the right thing to do. We learn that self-sacrifice is the right thing to do in Sunday school and at synagogue. We learn it in the movies and books that we read and watch and read. We, we all were raised with this idea, all the way from the day we could listen to the, to, to the present. So the question is, though, is it true? And this is where we need to meet people and say to them, look, if you don't know that it's true, if you don't know that morality is altruism, that altruism is the proven morality, then stop advocating. Don't freeze the concept of morality at the level of altruism. They're not the same thing. One of them is a broad concept. The other one is a, is a unit subsumed under that broad concept. Maybe hedonism is right. Maybe the Christian morality is right. It says you should sacrifice because God told you to. Kill your son because God said so. Right? Maybe that's right. Who knows? Until you have looked into this and figured out which morality is true, you shouldn't pretend that you know which one is. Independent thinking is something we need to tell people that they need to engage in. So let people know that, look, it's wrong to freeze the idea of morality at the level of altruism unless you've proven that altruism is true in your own mind. Now, the good news is that they can't prove altruism is true because there aren't any facts that give rise to the need of self-sacrifice. But helping people to start thinking about ideas in this way helps us move the ball. It helps us get people to start thinking about what really undergirds liberty. You know, once somebody sees, oh, you know, I have been equating altruism or morality with altruism all my life, maybe I should, you know, and then they start looking into it, then you're really right to, next time you have coffee with this person, you can say, you know, Ayn Rand came up with this whole different approach to ethics, where she said, well, why does man need values? Why does he need morality at all? And by pursuing this, and if you're an objectivist in the room, you know where I'm going with this, this by asking why man needs values to begin with, or moral principles at all, and pursuing the answers to those questions as Ayn Rand did, you will arrive at the conclusion that the standard of moral value, the standard against which you determine what's good and bad, right and wrong, how people should and shouldn't act, is what's good for their life. It's completely contrary to, to altruism. Egoism is the only morality that you can prove is true, but you shouldn't even accept that unless you understand it. It's wrong to accept any ideas unless you understand why they're true. And this is where we need to go. This is where we need to go. We need to help people see that you want liberty, you, then you need to understand that it's individualism versus collectivism. That's not a hard set. That's pretty easy. Most people can see that. You want individualism, then you have to understand the core of individualism, individual rights, what they are and where they come from. Now, what they license, they license selfishness precisely because their goal is to license selfishness. That's what their purpose of it is, to enable you to act selfishly so that you can live and to stop you from attacking others in case you wanted to do that so that they can live. And individual rights go both ways. They protect you and they protect others. They're, they're based on the requirements of life. They are a requirement of life. As Ayn Rand put it, that they're a requirement of human life in a social context. It's what an individual right is. Because other people could use force against you and stop you from acting on your judgment, we need a principle that says they may not. That's what rights are. So then we move down from there and say, and if you are going to challenge the moral code that you were raised with, the, this 2,500-year myth that sacrifice is good, and longer than that, God knows where it ever started. But if we're going to challenge that myth, then we have to employ the third element of the Trinity, independent thinking. If you're not willing to ask the tough questions, and if the people you're talking to, I mean, everybody in here is willing to ask the tough questions. I think even the people who are not necessarily on board with this, I know you're sitting there going, yeah, well, I need to think about this. But if you're talking to somebody and they're not willing to ask the tough questions, they're not, they're saying, oh, no, no, I'm not going there. Turn around and walk away. They're not worth, 
They're not worth your time. Certainly not if you're trying to spread liberty. We should spend our time only with people who are willing to think independently. And it is no argument from intimidation to sell somebody, if you don't understand why altruism is true, you have no business accepting it. And there's something wrong with that. Not intimidation, that's a fact. That's a fact. And we should use it. We should use it. We should say, if you're accepting a moral code just because you learned it in Sunday school, that is wrong. It's second-handed. It is wrong. We need to take people to the mat. We need to think in terms of these ideas ourselves. We really do. The battle for liberty is not a political battle. It's not. Politics is simple once ethics is understood. The battle is in ethics. So we need, when we are trying to spread the ideas to support liberty, we need to get quickly to morality. We need to get quickly to morality. Do not dilly-dally around you know, what capitalism is and you know, graphs about what happens when countries are more capitalistic and this, that. These utility, incidentally, arguing for capitalism just on the grounds that, well, economics shows that freer countries are wealthier countries. Well, that, so? That's not going to get you anywhere. It hasn't got, people have been arguing economic uh, uh, cases for capitalism for decades on end. It hasn't gotten us anywhere. Because if it's morally wrong for some people to have less than others, or if it's morally wrong for people to act selfishly, then you simply can't legalize it. You can't have a, a social system, the fundamental aspect of which is the legalization of selfishness. Whatever whatever economic facts you can impart to people, you are not going to sell them on capitalism if they think capitalism is immoral. So we need to move away from economic arguments. We need to move away, which, which tend to be based on utilitarianism anyway. It's like, okay, well, the society is wealthy. Well, so what? I don't care if the society is wealthy. I care about my life. And what, whether I'm free to act on my judgment and keep the, the, the product of my effort. Why? Because that's what I need to do in order to live. Some people aren't even concerned with wealth. They, they just want to live. You know, musicians go into music thinking, well, I'll probably never make a lot of money. I'm not going to be the next Justin Bieber or, or whoever, but I don't care. I want to play music for my living. This is somebody who's not so concerned about wealth. Economic arguments to this person aren't going to go but so far. It doesn't matter to me how wealthy this society is. I want to play my music. Speak to people on the level that, that goes to, to what matters to everybody. You should be able to guide your life by your own judgment. And it's right to guide your life by your own judgment. It's right to live a wonderful life. So we need a moral code to support that. So the bottom line here is that I think as advocates of liberty, if we're not there already, we should think in terms of individualism, individual rights, independent thinking, with an emphasis on this independent thinking part. If we are accepting moral ideas just because we heard them in the past, we need to stop that. We need to ask ourselves, what moral principles can be proven true? If they can't be proven true, we have no business accepting them. If we're already understanding what these moral principles are, why, why egoism is true, then I think we should take these ideas and realize that we need to start talking to people at this level. Bring out the distinction between second-handedness and first-handedness. Let people know that it's wrong to accept moral ideas just because other people said so, just like it's wrong to accept political ideas just because other people said so. That, that analogy is very effective. Let people know that it's wrong to package together things that conceptually are completely, that, that fundamentally are different. Self-interested action such as creating computers and exchanging them for value with others in a way that's good for everyone is completely different from stealing computers and hawking them on the black market. I mean, they're just not the same animal. Don't put them together. Don't put serving people together. Don't put together, you know, uh, 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 don't put the, all right, I'm getting it back. So don't, don't package deal on the selfishness side where Michael Dell is the equivalent of, of uh, Bernie Madoff, and don't package deal on the other side, on this, on this selflessness side, where Michael Dell is being selfless. Why? Well, because he's serving other people. I just heard George Gilder interviewed the other day uh, in which he, he mentioned Ayn Rand again because he mentioned that Although he liked Ayn Rand, uh, you know, she was wrong because capitalism really is all about altruism. Because why? Well, because the capitalist has to think about other people and he has to serve other people. George, that is ridiculous. 
The capitalist, capitalist isn't sitting there thinking, oh, I must serve other people. He's sitting there thinking, what do I love to do and how can I make money doing it? And that is all selfishness. So we need to not package together, uh, say, a Michael Dell who's trading value for value because he likes to build and sell computers and pretend that he's being selfless. He's not, because that's a very different action from what Mother Teresa does. Yeah. Giving away your life and all the things that you could have done with your life to wash feet in Calcutta because you think this is your moral duty. And incidentally, if you read Mother Teresa's um, uh, 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 notes or her, her, her memoirs, she was totally distraught by the fact that she was miserable in life because she was doing exactly what she thought she was supposed to do, what, you know, what the Bible told her to do, what Jesus was all about, sacrificing for others. And she thought, just like Catherine Halsey, incidentally, from the Fountainhead, she thought that because she had done all of this sacrifice, 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 that why is she so miserable? I don't know if you remember, but uh, Tui says to Halsey, Catherine, 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 Katie, 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 it's always about you. It's always about, like, you ridicule her for even questioning why she is, is unhappy. And in the case of Mother Teresa, she died unhappy, wondering why the Lord, who should be great, let her sacrifice all her life and then be miserable. And she even doubted his existence because of that. She doubted his existence because of that. Self-sacrifice leads to misery, no surprise. The good news is it's wrong. It's wrong to sacrifice. So to wrap this up, I think a good way to think about what liberty requires, what undergirds liberty, is this trinity. Individualism, individual rights and independent thinking. Import into your thinking and into your activism these ideas, package deals, frozen abstraction, the distinction between uh, first-handedness and second-handedness. Put good, it's a good kind of psychological pressure. This isn't illegitimate psychological pressure, it's good psychological pressure. Say to people, you should not accept ideas that, are, that you don't understand. Don't let people get away with this. And if they persist after you've brought this up, you, they're, they're not somebody who you're ever going to convert. They're just not. So uh, that's pretty much the closing of what I had prepared, but I'm delighted to, to take questions. And I know we have plenty of time for that. Yes? Yes. OK. Thank you.